I'm Matthew Young, and we have here Heather Cole, author of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, a descriptive bibliography, newly published by Oak Knoll Press, and uh, Tweed Roosevelt, uh, Teddy's great-grandson. And um, Heather, I wanted to start asking you about uh, your collaboration with uh, R.W.G. Vale from his work from 100 years ago, which must have been an interesting uh, an interesting way to work, and uh, and and I'm curious why it was went unpublished for so long. His original work. Yeah, so uh, Vale was the first librarian for the Roosevelt Memorial Association, which was founded soon after T.R.'s death um, as a center for to celebrate his life and work. Um, so this was before presidential libraries, um, and Vale was sort of tasked with collecting as much material on TR as he could. So he collected manuscripts and books and newspaper articles and photographs um, and really amassed an amazing collection, which uh, then became the Theodore Roosevelt Collection at uh, Harvard University when that um, the Memorial Association passed that collection on to them. Um, so while he was working as librarian, Vale started compiling a bibliography of all of TR's works. This was probably, in the, this was in the early 20s, uh, 1920s, and um, it turned into a massive project um, compiled on hundreds and hundreds of note cards. He would type up information about each book. Um, but because it was so big, and probably in part because um, they left the Memorial Association to go to the New York Public Library in 1927, um, the bibliography sat unfinished on these note cards for nearly 100 years. Um, I started working um, with the Roosevelt Collection um, in 2012 um, and received a lot of a lot of questions um, about TR's publications, um, whether it was particular works or how many books he published. Um, and it was hard for people to access um, that work that Vale had done. It was completely inaccessible unless you know people went through me and I was able to show them this work. So I took that on, um, and I can see now why nobody decided to publish it between the time Vale kind of stepped away. Um, and when I took it up again, it's just massive. Um, and so many of TR's books went through multiple editions, um, multiple issues, and some of that is gets really kind of thorny to track. So it was quite an interesting process. Um, wish I had 20 more years to kind of delve into some of this. 20 more years, well. <laughs> But but did did you feel that he was sort of pointing you in the right direction with with what he left behind? Absolutely. Um, it was really fun to find notes of his on the note cards that would say, you know, a future bibliographer, make sure that you check this or look into this more closely um, or to find notes in the books themselves. A lot of the books that he used um, for the bibliography are now at the Houghton Library at Harvard. Um, so I could tell um, that, yes, definitely, this is the first edition he was talking about. I could confirm that. Um, I could go back and search kind of things that he wasn't able to find. Um, he had the advantage of working really close to when a lot of these books were published, so sometimes within just a few years. So he could check with different publishers um, and confirm numbers of publication or um, print runs, different public success, how much money they made, all of that. So he was able to find a lot of good information just by being so close. Um, but I had the advantage of the internet. Um, so I could confirm a lot of the things where he said, like, oh, this is really rare, only 10 copies were published, where in reality I would find 25. Um, or I could see, like, okay, actually there wasn't, he might have had a question about a particular issue and I couldn't find any copies, so that may not necessarily 100% confirm that they weren't published, but at least I could say, like, maybe that wasn't actually a thing that um, was, was released or appeared. Um, so working together like that, um, was an interesting collaboration, a posthumous collaboration, I guess. Right. And Tweed, you've spent time with that with that archive also, haven't you? Oh, yes. I've been out there. I do a lot of research. This is, it's an extraordinary resource. And, of course, all the original stuff it has, thousands of letters and of diaries and so on. It, it, it is an enormous help to scholars uh, trying to study TR. And, of course, it, my role at various places, including the Theodore, Associ Theodore Roosevelt Association, we want scholars to be interested. They wouldn't have been able to write the kinds of biographies that they wrote if it weren't for the curators uh, of this, notably, of course, Heather and, and Wallace before her, uh, to point them in the right direction. A tremendous resource. Wonderful. 
um, the the breadth and range of what Teddy Roosevelt wrote, wrote is is so extraordinary. Um, he he started, I think, at the age of nineteen with a book with a book about birds, and then moved on almost immediately to a book about uh, the navy naval history of the War of eighteen twelve, which. Um, uh, so, so even though he wasn't in the Navy, it was never in the Navy, that was an interest of his. And, and uh, I, I listened to, to uh, your lecture yesterday, Tweed, about, uh, uh, about his interest in the Navy. Um, uh, tell us a little about that. Well, I, I'm doing a series for uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Institute at Long Island University, which I run, uh, on TR. And the one, as you say, was on the Navy. Interesting thing about that book you mentioned, uh, it was his senior thesis. And then after college, he went and worked uh, very hard, a lot of research in New York, at various places like the Astor Library, and then published it as a full book. It was his first real book. The first publication was just a very small item. Uh, and uh, it was very well received. In fact, so well received uh, that first of all, the US Navy uh, required that that book be carried on every naval vessel as part of the library that could be used by sailors as in their research of what they were figuring to do. It was a subject that hadn't been written about before. But what's even more astonishing is although he wrote, of course, from the American side, the Brits thought it was a terrific book, put it on all their capital ships, and when they were writing a, uh, a sort of definitive history of British Navy in the War of 1812, they asked TR to write the chapter on that section. Other notes that it, that it was re well reviewed both in this country and in the uh, and in England. And um, uh, I, I think Heather, your notes uh, are, are so valuable because they give um, they they give a sort of parallel biography of what what he was doing and, and uh, what he was thinking, what he was interested in, and the results of the book um, as we go through the bibliography. I mean, there, there are very few public figures like TR for so many reasons, but just in that the, the breadth of topics that he wrote about from natural history to naval history to Irish theater of all things. Um, he collaborated on a, a small work with George Bernard Shaw. Um, there were just so many things I think he was interested in and he decided to try his hand at and it ended up that he was really good at it no matter what topic he was writing about. Um, so I'm so, it's just so impressive um, to see that somebody who had a pretty busy day-to-day -day life was also then writing all of these books. And I'd say pretty impressive what you've done, Heather. I mean, this is an extraordinary volume. Uh, and it, we keep in mind, it only covers one aspect of TR's writings, essentially, his books. Uh, and there are just myriad other writings, like articles and introduction, books, introductions, and so on. But this 300 and I think 28 page book is really an extraordinarily valuable resource. You've really done a tremendous thing here for historians who are interested in TR and his period. Uh, and, and it's a fun to look at. Who would have thought a bibliography other than a librarian was fun to look at? It really is fun to look at. Thank you. Yeah, so Vail actually worked on, um, he also compiled all of the articles that TR wrote, which really amounted to one or two a month for the entirety of his adult life. Um, in addition to book reviews, um, in addition to collaborations he wrote, as you say, like introductions to others' works. So that might be a future project down the road for myself or uh, another scholar who wants to tackle that. Um, there are also quite a few collected editions of TR's works that appeared in his lifetime, and that would probably be its own project in itself. Um, so quite a lot more to be discovered about TR's publication. We're not, we're not gonna let you go. There's a lot <laughs> more to do here. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, they'll leave the groundwork for a lot of that, which is, is really helpful, and actually um, discovered a few uh, articles that uh, TR wrote early in his life. Um, and and some of his some of his books were parts of series. Some of the early books, which I which I found sort of interesting that he yeah. uh, participated in a, in a series. Like yeah, that. so this was before he was a well-known figure. He was looking to make money from the books that he was writing. So he was commissioned by various publishers, including Houghton Mifflin, to write um, in one case of uh, this series, which is the American Statesman series. 
um, which was a series of books on sort of the founding fathers and great figures of American history. So TR wrote two volumes for that series, um, Gouverneur Morris and Thomas Hart Benton, who are two figures who I don't think are as well known now. Um, but TR really threw himself into researching um, and writing these books. And these actually, um, if you look at kind of the figures, are among the best sellers of TR's works. These went into over 20 editions, each of them. Um, and sometimes it was because you were buying the entire series and it would look impressive on a shelf. Um, sometimes it was just after TR became well known, I think people were looking for the titles that he had written. Um, so that was, those series are, are really a fascinating piece of his literary life. He, uh, he took great interest in the format of his books and the and the the details of them they weren't most of them were not elaborately designed or anything but he he, he does seem to have been very involved in the production of uh, or, or at least the planning for the production of his books he was yeah you'd think someone as busy as tr would write the text send it off and just say okay that's great thank you so much um but there's evidence that he was really involved in looking at what color cloth was chosen for the covers um how the text appeared he was very interested in um, type design actually um so we have there are instances and in, i included them in the bibliography where he'd say like no i don't like that color cloth or yes this red cloth is the one i think that looks better um, or he would write to publishers saying like, why did you do things this way? Like, I don't include use in the spelling of things. That's too British. We got to change that. Um, so he definitely had a pretty clear opinion on how he wanted his books to look. That was very TR-ish. I mean, he, when he was president, he spent a lot of time, he believed in focusing on details. And so that all kinds of small details like that in all different kinds of areas. So it's not surprising at all. I think you mentioned earlier about finding articles. TR is reputed to have written of some 150,000 letters, and it's not surprising that we're finding more and more of those letters as time goes by. But the fact that we're finding articles that nobody knew about, I think is pretty extraordinary. Do you think there are more? Um, I'm not sure. Vail is very complete, so um, I'd be surprised if there are too many more that he didn't catch. Um, what about fiction? Um, so he had, I think he like early on wrote a few works of fiction. I don't, I don't think he did as an adult necessarily or in. I, I mean, don't remember that. There was South Southwest or whatever it was called. Yeah. Which was sort of fictional. Mm -hmm. but I don't think he wrote anything fictional at all. No, I mean, his real life was almost crazier than fiction. The South American trip, which he writes about in Through the Brazilian Wilderness, one of his final books. If anyone was going to make a biopic about TR, that's what I would choose. Like it's, Oh, absolutely. He nearly <laughs> killed him, didn't it? He yeah. killed several times. Um, if you read, there's a great book about that journey by Candace Millard, um, through, which is um, The River of Doubt. Um, and really like that, it's so cinematic when you just think about like all of the dangers that they faced and he's at the end of his life, he called it the last chance, my last chance to be a boy, um, when really he had no business hacking his way through the jungle um, at that point. And it just the, the encounters he had with native people there, with um, the Brazilians he was traveling with who he couldn't communicate with verbally, but I think they ended up being really close at the end of this harrowing journey. Um, it's really just fascinating. There are a lot of things at play. It's true. It was a fascinating story, but from a biopic, there's some serious problems. There's no feminine side to it. Yeah. <laughs> it would have, have to put a woman on the trip. I uh, and also it's a grim trip. I mean, it's a grim story. Uh, it was, I think, uh, I retraced this in 1992. It was actually, a, uh, it was a very hard trip. I think it was the least favored of TRs, but still one could do something with it, yes. Yeah. How, how did he manage to write all these books? He wrote, uh, it's, it's, it seems like almost a book a year or more uh, for most of his life um, while he was doing it, while he was uh, in politics and, and, and yeah, I think, president yeah. and everything. Um, well, no. One of the more astonishing things is the first book he, he published pretty much a book a year while he was president. I think that's true. And the first one was called The American Deer Family about the four legged deer uh, and a technical tome, more or less. It seems so odd that here's the president of the United States and that's what he published. But he loved to write. And Heather, I know you have lots of stories about that. 
Yeah, well, I mean, later in life, it seems like a lot of the books are collections of speeches that he gave um, or essays that were published elsewhere. So at least he wasn't, you know, he would be continuously coming up with that, um, those, that material, um, but it wasn't quite the same as creating a whole new book every year. So I think that helped a little bit, but he was still, he was writing an article for several every month. He was giving speeches all across the world. Um, so that was a lot of material. I don't think he slept very much. That's, I just don't think, I don't know how he could have been doing his job, whatever it was at that time, spending time with his family, and then also writing all these letters and all these articles. I think he just was really good at being productive um, and very efficient. I'm so envious of him. Um, I don't have all of his responsibilities, and yet it took me this long to put together this book. I feel like he would have been like, you could sleep less and get the, more done. The ultimate multitasker. Yes. <laughs> you, you know, you're right about sleeping less. Uh, there are various records of that. And he, he that, different times stated that he really slept about five hours a night. But more importantly, which you touched on, Heather, is that his ability to concentrate was really quite extraordinary. So for example, there are many stories of him sitting in the cabinet room and all the cabinet officers are talking about, you know, some huge policy issue. And at some point, you know, he, he might not be important to the conversation. And so instead of just sitting there looking at them, and letting them discuss something, he'd pick up a book and read it. Uh, he had books everywhere. So that was just an indication of his ability to concentrate. Yeah. What, what are your favorites of his books? Both of you. Um, so I am partial to the last book of his that was published kind of with his involvement. Um, he it was edited by a friend of his, Joseph Buckland Bishop. Um, that's Theodore Roosevelt's Letters to His Children, um, which was a compilation of letters that he'd written to his six children when they were young. Um, he was an amazing letter writer just to any of his friends, but with his children, when he traveled frequently, he would take time to write individual letters to each of the children, kind of addressing different ones, different interests of theirs, their pets, um, activities that he knew um, would it, he, they would each enjoy. Um, he'd illustrate them with little cartoons that are hilarious and just really, really fun. Um, so that book was actually one of his best sellers, probably the, the largest bestseller of his, um, mainly because I think um, he passed away earlier in the year in 1919. Um, so that book went through hundreds of thousands of copies. Um, so I really like that one just because it shows that sort of human side of him. Mm. Um, but I also really enjoy anytime he's writing about nature, aside from hunting and kill killing things, which is also, I mean, fascinating just when he's describing how with his bare hands he's killing all sorts of stuff. Um, but he just had a really good eye and a really good ear, especially um, for the sounds of nature, for the behaviors of animals. And I think it's among kind of his most beautiful writing when he's just sitting in the badlands or in a forest um, watching an animal and writing about its behavior. Um, they become characters for him um, and it's, it's really lovely. So, some of his writing was quite lyrical. Mm -hmm. uh, you read the introduction uh, to the African Game Trails, the story of going to Africa. That's beautifully written, I think. And some of his Western books writing about the West and the experience of it, really terrific writing. Much of it was journeymen and just telling stories, but he had a—he was a terrific storyteller. Even when he was a little kid, his brothers and sisters would all would ask him to tell stories to them, and he'd make them up on the spot. My favorite books, uh, I agree with you, Heather, are are uh, the sort of the the West books, uh, which are kind of a, a mix of the experience in the West and his hunting stories. And his hunting stories are a lot more than about hunting; they're first of all, really biological stories. I mean, he took great care studying the animals that he was hunting, and in fact became known as the leading American expert on big game animals in America. Even the, even the scientists would consult him with the various stories about that. So I like those best. The ones I can't read at all are the later life ones, which as Heather, you mentioned, are, are mostly sort of re- uh, processed uh, speeches and articles, and they're they're uh, they don't have the timeliness that the rest of his books. Even even the African Game Trails and the Through the Brazilian Wilderness are in that class. I love those books, and uh, they have a timelessness to them. But the political stuff is pretty dense, and I think few people read them, and not many later. 
yeah, they didn't sell particularly well at the time. Um, I think you can probably find most of his books in print now, but yeah, they're not, they're not very exciting reading unless you're researching a particular aspect of his policy or his beliefs or something, yeah. One uh, the, that sort of stood out as an unusual one was his, uh, I, I think it was from a talk he gave on, uh, on womanhood and childhood, preservation of conservation of womanhood and childhood. Yes, I, I admire so much about TR, but there are certain things where I'm like, I wish, <laughs> I wish you hadn't gone this far on these things. Um, he, he believed that women and men should be equal in marriage. Um, he had a lot of pretty progressive ideas. He supported women's suffrage. Um, but that particular book, a lot of it is about how he felt that particularly white women um, should have lots of white babies. Um, he was afraid of something he termed white suicide or race suicide, um, which was, you know, afraid that there would be fewer and fewer white people around. So everyone had to go and have many, many children. So, I mean, it's certainly later in his life, he got a bit more what we would now term sort of more right wing, I guess, in some of those views, not everything. He remained really staunch, um, progressive on so many issues, but there are things now where if I had a conversation with him, we'd, we'd have to explain things about being a progressive in 2020. And it wasn't, it wasn't just sexist. I mean, he, he, he believed in, which is grating perhaps to people now, but he believed in sort of the Western ideals. And by that he meant Northern European and, uh, and Protestant he meant too. Uh, and so uh, he was afraid that, for example, Catholics were out breeding uh, the rest of us. So he had some things that we would just rather forget about now, but who doesn't for most time? Anything else you'd like to cover? We can talk about kind of TR as a, a reader, as a child. Um, you know, the TR as a writer didn't emerge from nowhere. Um, he was always keeping journals um, from a very young age, um, wrote a lot of letters that would describe a lot of his activities. Um, and you can see the writer emerge you know, from early on. He's always describing adventures. He's very scientifically recording his observations of little mice and other specimens he kept in his childhood bedroom. Um, so it's sort of you can you can definitely see how the um, how he became this beloved figure um, and a really good writer. Um, it's there and, from the beginning. And, and, and he was sickly as a child. He was he was homebound a lot of the time. Yeah, He's I think that's one of the reasons that. He, he developed his writing ability because uh, he was at home. His, the family were readers. The Roosevelt's have always been readers. And so the house was full of books. There was no television, uh, no radio. Uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't really go out. He was very serious asthma. And so he had to make the best of it. And he became quite interested in his father's library. And there's stories of him as a toddler trying to carry around some of these tomes like uh, 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 Stanley's book about Africa and so on. So you see that early on. So he read there. But he also was a storyteller and he told his brothers and sisters stories and then later all his life he was an excellent storyteller. And historians, good historians, he wrote a book about histor history as literature, uh, not a book, a uh, article about history as literature and where he argued that and also with the scientific writing, he argued that uh, they had to tell stories. I'm not sure he put it that way, but you know, you had to keep the interest of the reader. You didn't get much of anywhere in your field if all you did was write for other people in the field and didn't involve everybody. And that involved telling stories. Uh, usually, when presidents write books nowadays, their campaign pieces, their memoirs, meant to make them seem a certain way. Um, and TR was probably our most prolific president. Um, I don't think there has ever been anyone in who's that much of a public figure writing on this many topics, writing this much, um, and enjoying so much of it and not being about presenting himself all the time um, as this electable person, but really just here's something that is interesting. I think you'll find it interesting too. Um, and I think that's really, it's really what makes him unique. And he wasn't just writing, he was, he was doing all these things um, mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. And, and the legacy that he left, the park, the park service and, and um, the histories uh, is just wonderful. Yeah, he, uh, and also, you know, other than Lincoln, he's probably the president that has the most books written about him. What I'm astonished now is 
the Theodore Roosevelt Association has an annual book prize uh, for the best book, current book on TR. And every year they consider four or five books, major books on various parts of TR. What's happened is there are fewer biographies and more of them on specific subjects. But every year, TR is a main character is in at least five of them. And there's probably another 15 or so where he's a huge supporting actor. So he's also in the books written about him. Uh, people, you know, some, they've, they, they ask the public sometimes of which presidents had the most writings, you know, wrote most. It's quite interesting to me because often people say Jefferson, which is interesting because Jefferson only wrote one book, basically. Uh, and there are a few others. I don't know, uh, uh, Heather, who do you think is second? I think it is Jefferson, actually. I mean, not necessarily books, but articles and pamphlets and great, you know, pieces of American history. Um, but TR is number one. Well, thank you both for for joining me and, and talking about this. And we will have to uh, we'll have to look into this. Uh, uh, TR Association Book Award and submit this one. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sure we'll get there. Send them one. Well, thank you both. Thank you. And, uh, thank I hope you. we'll talk again soon. Yeah, this was fun. Take care. Bye-bye.